Hello everybody, welcome to the latest Sky F1 vodcast and we are joined today, myself, Karun Chanduk and Paul DeResta by a legend of the sport, a man who competed in every year in the 1990s across many different teams including Ferrari with one win in 201 starts. It is the legend that is Jean Alesi. Jean, thank you so much for joining us and firstly can I say how jealous I am to see where you're <laughs> sitting because <laughs> the weather's got very British here. Yeah, well, I'm in the south of France, but um, the last few days you had a good uh, weather as well, so be happy. Yes, exactly. we're always happy, we're always happy, but great to see you. Um, how have you been spending lockdown and uh, yeah, where are you, what, what have you been up to? You know, I have a vineyard here on the front of the house and I work with um, the people who normally I, I have on the phone and um, I was with them in the, in the land. That was a, a fantastic time for me actually because... Uh, it has been for for too much time I was not involved of uh, of this kind of job so I hope the, the the wine will be good this year because otherwise uh, I will be blamed by the staff. <laughs> I was going to say what, what wine is it Jean? Uh, should we look out for the label? Yeah the label is very easy it's a Jean Alizy uh, oh, right. <laughs> but um, it's a Cote du Rhône uh, we have uh, three uh, uh, Grapes, Syrah, Grenache, and Mouvred, and um, we are keeping. Um, we have a good, a good uh, notes uh, rating in most of the the year, so I'm very happy about that. What a place to spend lockdown in your own vineyard! <laughs> you lucky thing. I, I'm doubly jealous now. <laughs> there we go. There we go, Paul. I guess it's not the usual grape juice that Simon's used to drinking, John. The quality. Hi, Paul. Probably a bit higher. Um, <laughs> I guess you probably feel it's ready to go, John, because obviously your son uh, is taking part in F2 this year. Um, have you been spending much time with him and trying to get him prepared as well? Because this has been an unusual break for any driver. And with your experience over the years, how is best to go about that? Yeah, it, is, uh, it was nice to have him at home as well because we have the simulator here in the house. But uh, unbelievable, you know, everything was uh, ready. They test in uh, in Bahrain and um, for three days with uh, HWA, the team you know, and um, everything was um, pre pretty well, perfect to go. And uh, suddenly we had the lockdown, so you know, for for kids to be, um, let's say, focused and to wait uh, the moment, that uh, will be a big issue because. Uh, Eight uh, races in a row is going to be uh, um, something unique. So I hope uh, they will uh, be able to, to make it well. John, I want to get your thoughts on the F1 driver market because although we've so seen you know, no racing on track, there's been lots going on um, behind the scenes with, with people moving around. I mean, back in, in 1990, you were the man. You had all, you know, a contract with Williams, a contract with Ferrari, Tyrrell had a contract, McLaren wanted you. How important is it to choose the right team at the right time? I mean, take Daniel Ricciardo, for example. We saw he went to, to Enstone where you were. It hasn't worked out. He's gone away. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the importance of, of being in the right place at the right time? Yeah, of course. You know, probably this uh, new generation of uh, Formula One, it is even more difficult than in my time because um, the staff, uh, one uh, chief designer, like he used to be in my, uh, in my in 90s, you know. And um, I'm sure um, it is a kind of uh, sometimes luck to have uh, the good move at the, uh, at the good time, you know, because uh, if I remember, and when I moved to, uh, to Ferrari and then to Benetton, the engineer always uh, moved, you know, on the same time. That is something you will not is not able to uh, to happen again, you know. So um, I have to say you need to be, uh, of course, a bit lucky in the in the choice. A bit lucky in the choice, but you know, if you put yourself in Sebastian Vettel's position, uh, for example, do you think that um, with the way things have gone, do you, do you think it might have been a conscious decision? I know Helmut Marco has come out today and said, look, he probably realizes that actually the Ferrari wasn't going to be as competitive as it might have been even for the last two seasons. Maybe he did have a say in leaving Maranello. Do you think there's any truth to that, potentially? Well, you know, I, I have a massive uh, respect for Sebastian because four-time world champion, he put his, uh, his um, 
talent is um, everything, you know, into um, this um, challenge to be a world champion with Ferrari. And uh, he failed. He failed, but uh, not because it's his fault or not because it's the fault of the team. Something di didn't go well uh, before the championship start, actually. But uh, that means uh, a lot, I think, for someone like him to have been um, um, to have this the, to be brave enough to say, okay, it, it's enough. I will. I will finish the season with Ferrari but next year I don't know what I will do but for sure something didn't go exactly like uh, it's supposed to. Ferrari have had a lot of management changes, uh, a lot of the leaders have moved on uh, they've not given people uh, a lot of time. Do you think the politics within Ferrari wear you down um, emotionally because if you even look at Fernando Alonso how he um, at the end of Ferrari days, the relationship wasn't great. Do you, do you feel that's the same with Sebastian, that it just was a time that it wasn't going to go on? Well, you know, um, there is a, a two speed. The first speed is uh, when you um, welcome a world champion like uh, Sebastian, you want to, to give everything you can. The second speed is uh, if you are able to. And when the team is not able to, uh, to give what the, 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 the champion is asking, then the trouble starts, you know. And um, if I take the, the Michael Schumacher uh, example, he took my place, but when he arrived, he arrived with a full team, you know, a, a full technical team. And he worked with the same people he used to work to be world champion. It, it took uh, him uh, four years, I think, to be world champion, but it he, he happened, you know. In uh, Sebastian, the uh, situation was different. He arrived in a team, and he tried to um, teach and to uh, bring the team, uh, the, the technical team to work as he wants. But, um, you know, he didn't brought with him uh, Adrian Newey, so that changed a lot. I was going to say, Jean, I mean, you were with Ferrari from what, 91 to 95. Um, what was the atmosphere, what was your relationship like with the senior figures there when he departed? <laughs> when I left, you mean? When, yeah, when you left, when you left Ferrari. Well, you know, for me it was a shock because um, I signed with Ferrari because uh, I was young and um, the, the, the team uh, invest, I mean, Ferrari invest with uh, a young driver and I had Alain Post as a team, teammate. And that was uh, fantastic to have uh, Alain close to me. He was uh, the professor. I was a beginner. And that was uh, the, the, the top scenario. But... Uh, everything went uh, completely um, mad because he he didn't get exactly what he wants. He was fired at the end of the season, and then um, everything went down, 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 up to '95. In '95, slowly we came back. Uh, Jean Todd was uh, very efficient in the team, so the team started to be uh, all very good. You know, we we were facing some reliability problems, but uh, the car was competitive. And, uh, and then uh, they decide to, uh, to take uh, Michael, so I have to, left, to leave the team. And that was a, a shock. <laughs> yeah. Jean, can I ask you, you know, we've got Carlos Sainz coming in. You know, we've talked about Sebastian, but let's talk about Carlos coming in now into that Ferrari seat. It, it's a very young lineup. It, it's, you know, you mentioned you had Prost there, somebody you could learn from as a professor. He went, you then, you know, had younger teammates after that. Do you think this is going to be tricky for Ferrari, having two relatively young and inexperienced drivers compared to having, you know, a four-time world champion or, or someone as an established star number one? Well, I think it's a, maybe the opposite, you know. They will have um, um, something, I can say, easy to, to control, you know, because uh, they have two young kids. They have two professional drivers. Uh, Carlos, um, if I understand, is a very hard worker and uh, he has the experience because McLaren and Renault, he is coming from uh, very experienced teams. So um, for, for the management, it's going to be easier to control these uh, two drivers, you know, because when, when you have a world champion, when you have a, 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 a 
you know, charismatic, uh, charismatic uh, driver is very tough, you know, to, uh, to make him soft. Yeah, what about some of the, the, the other moves? Let's get your, your views, obviously, John. When you, when you get someone like yourself on here, we, we really respect your opinions on what's going on in Formula One. Can I ask you about the other ones? Do you think Daniel Ricciardo is going to be a good fit for McLaren? Who do you think is going to take uh, the spot at Renault? Do you think Alonso can come back? And, and finally, as well, on the, on the budget cap, um, you know, what, what do you think of the rules going forward? You know, I'm a, a massive fan of Formula One. And uh, the driver you mentioned, I'm a fan of them because uh, they, uh, they drive with emotion. Uh, Daniel Ricciardo is always uh, in, a, in a car and out the car, uh, a, top, uh, uh, a top guy. Everybody loves him. I, I really hope he will be uh, able to, uh, to make uh, with uh, McLaren something uh, different than what he, he has with, uh, with Renault. And, um, and of course, you know, Fernando Alonso is a legend. If he can come back, it's nice. Do you think Fernando really would come back, John? Well, uh, you know, I'm 56 in next week. If uh, someone will ask me to come back, I will come back. <laughs> and uh, why? Because of the emotion and the love around, around the, what we, uh, we love most is the Formula One. And for sure, uh, Fernando, uh, in, in, in his blood, uh, he has uh, still the, the Formula One. And, uh, you know, driving a sports car is nice, but... Uh, you share the car, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm sure uh, if he has the opportunity, he will come back. So go on, John, tell us, where do you think Sebastian Vettel is going to end up? Do you think he's, this, is, this is the end of the road for him? Or w w what do you think? Well, it's going to be uh, difficult, but uh, everybody talk about him uh, on a positive way. So uh, I hope he will have a, and he will find um, a drive for, for him and for the fan like I am to, to watch him racing again. Who excites you the most in Formula One, Jean? The, we're going to the Red Bull ring uh, for a couple of the, the, the first two races there. Uh, a few people thinking maybe that might play into last year's winner's Max Verstappen's hands. Do you think he might have a genuine shot at the title this year uh, in what's been you know, dubbed the, the COVID season? Um, because we don't know how, what form it will take and it might be short. Well, you know, in my time, uh, I will say uh, I love Senna because his driving style. Uh, I don't I, I don't like Alain because when he drives, he looks like a, a grandmother driving uh, to uh, <laughs> going to holiday on the motorway, you know, on uh, M1. Well, so you know, uh, it was very easy to understand the driving style. Not anymore because now uh, all the drivers they drive the same tires, they have uh, the same issue. If they overheat the uh, the tires, if they make uh, a flat a flat spot the the, the race is over so what i, I like it's uh, the combination of drivers so i love to see in silverstone uh, max with um, with uh, 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 charles that was an amazing race i love to see um, in the past uh, rosberg with uh, lewis fighting in bahrain you know this kind of uh, races give you a lot of emotion and that is the, 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 the combination of some drivers are very, very, very nice to watch. So uh, my most exciting uh, couple, I will say, is uh, Max Verstappen and Charles Leclerc. They obviously are a young generation, John, uh, but I guess you've been very closely watching the junior formulas as well because your son is racing them like you talked about at the start. Is there anybody special coming through there? that you've got your eye on as well, that's going to join these guys? Because they're the future of what we're going to be watching in 10 years. Yeah, we, we have to wait a little bit because, um, well, first of all, in Formula 2, this year is going to be a nightmare because uh, all this race together. Uh, we talk about budget cap, but um, uh, nothing was uh, for Formula 2. Uh, they didn't change the, the price of the, the fee of anything. So I'm sure a lot of drivers will uh, not finish the season. And that will be a, a disaster season for the Formula 2 and Formula 3 drivers. So I hope uh, in this uh, big uh, mess, something will, uh, will change and will give the opportunity of these uh, drivers who make a, a big investment 
uh, not uh, only on money side, but also in the life side, because they uh, quit school, they quit university, because they dream to be a, a racer, and uh, nobody is looking after them. And I'm very, very sad about that, because, uh, you know, um, I'm a, a next Formula One driver, I have connections, but I had to, to sell my Formula, my uh, Ferrari F40 to give the budget of my son to race in Formula 2. And uh, why? Because uh, it's almost mission impossible to find sponsorship. And on the meantime, on the, on the front of you, you have just uh, the prices of uh, the tools too expensive. And nobody wants to change it. So that will not... Uh, 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 not stay forever. I was going to say, ouch. Uh, that, that's a that's a price to pay. I mean, even for your son, an, an F40 is a beautiful car, uh, Sean. So yeah, it must have been hard to part with. But as you say, you do anything for him to to help him progress in that formula, yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's my passion, and uh, in the family, we um, uh, we we do the things with a passion. And uh, to have a, Fer a Ferrari F40 in a garage, or to see my uh, my son racing. There's no, um, no comparison. Uh, I prefer him uh, racing and, um, and the F40. I'm too old now to drive it. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you can still make your comeback for Formula One. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure you picked up any last time. So I, know, I know that's the, the, the case with the budget cap or lack of it in, in, um, in Formula Two. But what do you think about the 145 reducing to 135 Ferrari your old team already talking about maybe you know because they're going to have to cut some staff moving them across and potentially a, an IndyCar entrant or your know, world endurance championship and just having to do that to, to, to sort of tide things over for the moment um, do you think it's sensible what, what Formula One's put in place absolutely absolutely you know uh, no doubt I'm, I'm an old man but I don't want to be uh, uh, boring when I'm seeing that. But in my time, uh, teams like uh, Tyrell uh, had a chance with a very small budget to compete against uh, McLaren or against Ferrari. I was driving the car. Um, and I was leading some Grand Prix with this kind of car. And the budget, I, I, I promise you, I was not able to, to check in detail, but uh, uh, everybody knew Ken Tyrell. And uh, everybody knew his system. He was just uh, making a, a, a car, and uh, the uh, the designers the designers had the chance to make something different to be competitive. Uh, now I don't know what's happened, but the price is just uh, the end of the world, you know. And uh, when we talk about uh, this budget cap, it's already very high the the level of uh, going down, you know. So even some teams who had um, the, the chance to uh, to reduce the cost, they will be not able to go to this cost. <laughs> Jean, I want to get your thoughts on um, race formats because that was a, a big talking point. It looks like it's not going to happen now. Mercedes and Toto seem seem against it. Uh, obviously, you know, in F2, we have that. We have the top eight, the partially reverse grade for, for the Sunday race. It gives other people a chance to mix up. We see some overtaking. What are your thoughts? Would you have liked to see something different in F1, especially you know when we're doing two races at the same track back to back? Well, you know, uh, the reverse grid I think is very good for uh, the category like Formula Three, Formula Two, or Formula Four, but not Formula One. And I tell you why. You know, uh, again, uh, if I look what I did in my in my time, the technology, the technique uh, was uh, a little bit more freedom. For the engineers and um, at the start of the grid you had v12 v10 and v8 engines at the beginning of the races when i uh, i start in p5 or 6 with my tyrell i had maybe 25 20 uh, 30 kilo less fuel than the mclaren or honda or ferrari so my car was much more competitive and that mixed and for the few 15 laps I was overtaking Senna, I was overtaking uh, Nigel Mansell, this, uh, my, my heroes, but I was, uh, everybody thought uh, I was uh, uh, different, but I had a light car. And then slowly, you know, when they burn the fuel, they start to be again uh, fast and coming back. But that, make, that makes the race 
extremely interesting because always something was happening. Now, when you start with the same engine, same tires, same aero, um, the top team will always make a difference. You know? John, before you leave us, um, your sole victory, 1995 Canadian Grand Prix, it's the 25th uh, anniversary, I think, in, in six days' time, isn't it? The 11th of June. Um, how will you be celebrating? I, I can imagine how you'll be celebrating if you've got a cellar full of Cote de Rhone, but um, yeah, what will you be doing to, <laughs> to enjoy that one? No, you know, um, it's a long time ago, but it's so fresh in my mind. I remember everything from this weekend, the warm-up. I want to win this race, you know, and uh, straight away, I think after a few laps, I, I was P2 behind uh, behind um, uh, Mick, uh, Michael, sorry, and um, and then he stopped, uh, 11 laps to go, he stopped to, because he had a, a technical issue. And to be honest, uh, I like to, uh, to win uh, with everybody on track, but when he stopped, I didn't care. And uh, at the end of the race, I said, look, uh, Michael, how many times I was going to win and I had a brake failure or I had a a gearbox problem, so I don't care. I won, and and he was very happy. I mean, we had a good uh, party together. Fantastic stuff. Uh, honestly, Jean, we could we could talk for hours. I really, really appreciate uh, you coming on today to to talk. It looks like there might be a black cloud behind you, so I'll uh, I'll let you uh, <laughs> I'll let you get indoors in case that deposits on your head. Fantastic. We look we look forward to hopefully seeing you at some point this season, and also to watching your son. Best of luck to him in, in Formula Two. You think he's got a, a shot at it? Sorry? Do you think he's got a shot at it, the F2 title this year, old junior, junior Lacey? Well, uh, he has to. He has to. He knows uh, all the effort we all made uh, around him and uh, he has a good team now and uh, I really believe in it. Thank you, Jean. We appreciate it. We'll let you go. Thanks so much and uh, enjoy, yeah, enjoy the celebrations for, for Canada. And let's bring in, talking of F2, uh, Jack Aiken, who will be driving this year uh, for Campos. I think he's uh, about ready to come onto the line. But yeah, always good to talk to uh, Jean, uh, Paul. It's a passionate racer. Absolutely. And, you know, like you say, it's timeless when you get to speak to these guys uh, just to get their opinion because they've, they've lived through different times. Uh, they're certainly still around. Certainly, John's, you know, you still see his image bouncing around the paddock. He's still very connected with people. And that's because, you know, as you say, young junior. Is, is well involved. So that's why I was interested to see what his take is on the junior you know, categories, where they are. But it's nice to see that he's a fan of sport. He just wants to see guys going at it hard. And you know, when he talks about the, the likes of Verstappen and Leclerc, so it just shows you he, he likes a bit of elbows out because that's what those two did last year. You know, they clashed, but professionally they got up, dusted themselves off, and then battled it on to the next round. Well, there you go. I mean, that's, that's the thing, isn't it? It's quite interesting to see that he was putting the pressure on, on his son, Giuliano, this year to come over the title. He knows he's got to do it. Otherwise, you know, it is difficult to make your way out of that category into the top level. BW Giuliano will have to buy him another F40, if not. <laughs> Giuliano will have, will have to. I can't believe he'd have to give that up. Amazing stuff. But uh, Jack Aitken will be racing alongside uh, LAC next year, but he, in, the, in the Campos colours. And he joins us now. Hello, Jack. How are you doing? How's lockdown? Um, everything, you know, on track, do you think, for getting started? It's, a, it's going to be a pretty hectic start to the season, isn't it? Even in F2. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's um, going to be extremely hectic, even more so than normal. I think we're all used to a lot of travel and uh, time on the road. But uh, this is taking it to another level, isn't it? It's um, going to be, what, three weekends on the bounce at points. Uh, lots of back-to-backs. I'm looking forward to it, but um, it's going to be tough. It is going to be tough. How have you been keeping yourself in, in shape? Can you do so? I mean, I know karun has been out karting. There's a few of the drivers. Uh, Lando Norris, for example, was out the, the other day. Um, have you been able to get out on a circuit anywhere? No, I haven't. Not yet. Um, I'm trying to find a way to do it. Obviously, it's quite tricky to, to do that, still respecting all the rules. But um, I'm hoping I'll get out in something before the season starts, just to get the rust out. But um, yeah, we'll see. Jack, you need to call those, um, those Renault guys you used to work with. They're all testing the Formula 3 cars this week. That's, they've been up at Silverstone. Uh, well, you know, obviously they're much better connected than I am. <laughs> there you go. 
Um, so listen, let's um, let's talk. Obviously, you're, you're now working with Williams. Uh, you've shifted from from Renault across here. Have you been back in the simulator? We know um, our Sky F1 colleague Anthony Davidson's uh, kicked off work at Mercedes. So uh, today, actually, in fact, I think Ant's back in the sim. So have you started doing some stuff with Williams yet? So we're just going through the process of um, assessing out how we're going to do it. But I will be back in the sim very soon from from early next week. Um, and then it will get quite quite busy from that point forward. Obviously, George and Nikki are going to be doing a lot of time in the sim as well, um, especially if that's uh, one of the few ways that we can prepare. So uh, definitely going to be spending a lot of time there over the next few weeks. Obviously, you're quite connected, Jack, with Williams now. I'm sure you've got a lot of contact with people because they are back in the factory and things are going again. How are you kind of seeing people's feelings and emotions after the announcement, you know, not long ago that the team's effectively up for sale and looking for stability in the future? Yeah, I think it's um, obviously been a um, it's big news, but equally, I think a lot of us are quite focused on just trying to get back to racing. There's a lot of um, a lot of stuff on our plate to get ready for those upcoming races. So everyone is quite focused on just preparing game back to a normal-ish way of working and um, just getting our heads down, really. So that's the, the main thing, that's the um, main feeling, I would say, in the factory. Jack, can you tell us a little bit more about your your role with Williams? Because, you know, you're expecting to be in the car. Or is this more a, a sort of, fim, you know, factory-based simulator role? What, 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 what's your position within the, the driver lineup? So I'm the reserve driver, and that's going to mean I'll travel to all of the races, even when I'm not racing Formula 2 in the support. I do a lot of time in the simulator, try and help the guys develop the car, a um, bit more forward thinking in terms of um, you know parts that we're producing further down the line, and just trying to learn as much as I can as well. Uh, you know, I, there's, there's a, a lot, lot of it. information flying around and. The more of that I can absorb and learn from, especially from um, George and Nikki as well, then the better off I'm going to be. And um, that's all trying to progress me towards racing with the team eventually. Are you going to get a chance to drive the car this year on a Friday still? Yeah, that's still the plan. Um, still figuring out what's best in terms of where and when. But um, I think we're trying to get it done as early as possible, just in case. So I've actually... Um, got some familiarity with the car should I need to jump in. Yeah, you must be pumped for that. I was going to say, look, everyone's hoping that the biosphere does its job and that we, we don't get any cases in the paddock of, of Corona. But, you know, should we do that? I mean, the chances are higher than in a usual uh, season, you'd think, that a reserve driver might get called upon because we know they're operating in these bubbles. They've got the PPE, but... If a mechanic gets it, then a driver will have to be isolated, for example. Um, are you, have you been, you must be aware of that. Is that something that you guys have, have talked about? There's a, there's a higher chance than normal that you might be in a car. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. It's still, I'd say, unlikely just because um, the guys are going to be very, very careful. I mean, if you're a driver, um, and especially with the advice that they have from the physios and from the team side, um, they put a lot of guidelines in place to make sure that they do as much as possible to ensure that doesn't happen, <laughs> unfortunately for me. But, you know, it's just one of those things. I'll be ready if I'm needed. Uh, maybe Paul can give me some tips. But yeah. um, I think it's still on the low chance side. But um, I'll be ready if it does happen. What about with F2, Jack? Because, you know, we, we, we hear a lot about the, the protocols in place that are, you know, for, for F1 teams and people in the paddock and stuff. What, what's, what's the story there too? Because you, they're much smaller teams. You know, there's the infrastructure and the funding they've got for, for, for example, testing kits and all of that stuff is much less than an F1 team. Have you, have you spoken much to Campos and, and the F2 organizers about that? Yeah, there's a, a running dialogue with the, the organizers. Um, they themselves are taking the directive from Formula One, um, as is the case a lot of the time with the support series. We follow what they do and to as much of an extent as possible, we'll try and follow their guidelines. You are right that the resources isn't quite the same. Um, so we're still awaiting some of the details of the planning, but you know, it's generally common sense is coming through and um, it's, we will be in our own little bubble as well, away from the F1 paddock in the back somewhere, but 
all the rules, same rules will still apply. I just want to take you back again because obviously you mentioned that um, Stepan and I did when Mata took ill in Hungary a few years back. Do you feel like you're ready if you get the chance? Because I, you know, I kind of took that role on at Williams alongside my Sky duties, thinking, well, it's never going to happen. You know, up until the point of actually um, getting the call to say you probably should come down the paddock, I was ironing a shirt on TV compound. Uh, I never really second guessed it in the sense of uh, because I'd driven F1, I'd been part of the emotions, I knew what was expected of me. Uh, even sitting in the engineering briefing, long and painful when you're not actually a driver. It's hard, but you need to digest that. But, you know, I guess it's make or break time. And I guess the way uh, the calendar is at the moment, uh, you know, drivers are probably going to be staying around. Uh, you need to make a, you need to make it a one hit wonder if, you're, if it is going to happen, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, um, that's the way in F1, isn't it? You, if you have a chance, you absolutely have to take it and you don't get many second chances. So I do all of the, the physical training. I mean, this is the boring stuff, but you do all the physical training that you have to to make sure that you could do it if you really had to step in. Um, like you say, the briefing's maybe not the most interesting if it doesn't apply to you, but it might apply to you. So you, you go and you attend it and you, you try and listen and take everything in. And um, although I have not driven the Williams car, I have driven F1 equipment before. So that gives me a little bit more confidence of knowing what to expect. And um, just having an attitude, I guess, of just go and see, you know, it's, I've jumped into faster cars at short notice before, even if it's not F1, I've jumped into an F2 car or an F3 car and you have to perform straight away. That's always the way. So um, yeah, just, uh, just, Ready and waiting. <laughs> I bet you are. I bet you are. Jack, let's finish, if we could, though, with the, the F2 lineup this year. Um, and do you think it's, uh, you know, a, a strong field, if you like? I'm quite look, looking forward. I think we all are. We've heard a lot about Dan Tictum coming into this. He's quite a character. Is it, is it going to be full of characters? Do we think we're going to you know, have a, a, a tight race for the title? I think so. Um, more than previous years, I'm having a hard time picking out who I think are going to be the, the contenders because, um, apart from myself, of course, sure. <laughs> um, it's, it's a quite a varied field and I think quite a talented one. We've got, you know, a few guys coming up from F3 who are all, you know, clearly quick guys and they're all with quick teams. Um, you know, Dan, like you say, coming back and um, he's, you know, had a bit of a chance to get to know him in the Williams Academy. He's a really good guy and he is quick as well with Dan, so I'm sure he'll be a threat. Um, and you've got a couple of experienced guys as well, like uh, Luca Giotto sticking around. So I think it's going to be massively competitive. Good stuff. Uh, Jack, look, we really appreciate your time. Um, we will see you all being well. What is it? Are we a month? It's the fifth today, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, exactly a month's time, we'll be racing uh, in Spielberg. In the meantime, uh, we wish you well with your preparations, both in F2 and as uh, reserve driver. Uh, for Williams. Thanks to Paul, thanks to Karun, and thanks for you uh, or to you at home for watching. We'll see you on Monday, 2 o'clock on Sky Sports F1 for the F1 show. In the meantime, uh, enjoy your weekend from us all here. Bye-bye.